Good evening. I'm going to briefly just talk about the four R's of a quiet time. We all know about the three R's, right? Reading, writing, and arithmetic. Um, now we're going to go with the four R's of, of, of a quiet time. Um, this past Monday, I was helping my son memorize this 23rd Psalm, and we had a Bible. It was the old King James, um, and we kept getting to the part where he leadeth me beside the still water. And every time my eight-year-old son got to still, he said, calm. And then, you know, it got me thinking. You know what? Stillness is not a word that many of us even use anymore, let alone experience. Yet today, perhaps even more than ever, we desperately need the spirit of stillness. We're constantly on the move, stretched to the max by all of our demands of daily lives, and then all too many times we let our busy schedule crowd out our time with the Lord. In order for the spirit of loveliness to live in us, we must seek our opportunities to rest, plan, regroup, and draw closer to God. How do we do this? We really need to make an appointment with God. We need to have a quiet time with God. And one of the first verses that you see there it says, he says, be still. And isn't that hard? Be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. Psalm 46, 10. And then another verse. This is what the sovereign Lord, the Holy One of Israel says. In repentance and rest is your salvation. In quietness and trust is your strength. But you would have none of it. Isaiah 30, 15. Point one, uh, the first R is, first thing we need to do is somehow is relax. Relax. God desires to spend, alone, some, spend time alone with us, and after all, we are his children, and he wants to get to know us. Um, and, and you know what? Every time that we spend with God, it's never wasted. If you spend alone with God in the morning, you will start the day refreshed and ready to whatever comes your way. If you spend it at night... You'll go to sleep relaxed and resting in his care, knowing that a new day comes where you'll be serving him. The issue I find is there's always these inner noises or outer noises that make it very difficult. Actually, the outer noises are probably the easier things. The TV, the kids, anything else that's going around, um, that we can move. The problem that we have, that I have a lot, is more of the inner noises. You start reading, and then what do you start thinking about? All the things that you have to do tomorrow, all the other things, and you really never get to focus on really what you're there to do. And that is, I find, one of the biggest challenges. Um, if noise is all around us, we have to make a time for a quiet time. I read about Susanna Wesley, the mother of Charles and John Wesley, and 17 other children. I think she had 19. Um, where it was said that she, it was known that she pulled her apron over her head to let her family know that she was having a quiet time with God. <laughs> I'm not, I'm not suggesting that. Um, but the point is, nothing, something needs to be done uh, to establish a time with God. Why do it? Why do it? Why have a quiet time with God? Why should we spend the 15 minutes, the 20 minutes, the half an hour? One, to fellowship with God. God wants to know us, and he wants us to know him. He desires his, this communion and worship and deserves our devotion. As Pastor Nick said on Sunday, he is, a, he is jealous for us. He wants that for us. Psalm 29, 2, ascribe to the Lord the glory due his name. Worship the Lord in the splendor of his holiness. And then you are worthy, our Lord and God, to receive glory and honor and power. For you created all things, and by your will they were created and have their being. And then James 4, 8, come close to God, and God will come close to you. First thing we need to do is relax. Have a quiet time to fellowship. It also, the second thing, why we should do it, it, it prepares our heart to listen. 
listening to God is just like listening to anyone else. Before you can hear him, you must be ready to listen. And as in a conversation, you cannot hear the other person if you're talking or if your mind is about other things. You cannot hear the other person. So therefore, if we're distracted, we really can't listen to God. We, this helps us to prepare our heart to listen. And in Jeremiah 29, 13, you will seek me and find me, and when you seek me with all your heart. The third thing, why should we have our uh, quiet time? To renew our strength. To renew our strength. But they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. Isaiah 40, 31. One of the great imageries of the Bible. Uh, you know, I've read that birds, there's three ways of methods of flight for birds. One is flapping, where they have to flap, flap, flap. They get in the air, but it's a lot of work. The other one is gliding. Once they get enough speed and then they're basically coasting downward, that's another one. But then the last one, something that eagles do, is that they soar. They're strong enough, and they basically catch rising air currents, and they just soar sometimes to 80 miles an hour. And here the Bible is telling us, if we wait upon the Lord, we shall mount up with wings as eagles. What I find interesting is the other part. You know what? Not always are we... Mounting up with things as eagles. Sometimes, sometimes in our lives, we're lucky that we're running and not, we're, we're not getting tired. And then if you keep looking, sometimes we're lucky we're walking and not fainting. <laughs> That's just the way it is. Wouldn't it be great to be soaring as an eagle all the time? Um, but you know what? In any, in any part of our life, God is there with us and we have to wait on him. Fourth one, to give... The other reason why we need to have a quiet time with God, to give ourselves a regular spiritual checkup. The best way to balance your life is to evaluate yourself regularly. And God places a high value on the habit of self-evaluation. I know as a teacher we call it, I think, something like metacognition. We have to think about thinking. All right, whatever. Um, <laughs> but, but here in the Bible, we are told that the Bible, we have to test and examine our own spiritual health. We have to do that regularly. 1 Corinthians 13, 5, examine yourself to see whether you are in the faith. Test yourselves. Do you not realize that Christ Jesus is in you? Unless, of course, you fail the test. Lamentations, let us examine our way and test them. And let us return to the Lord. Number one, relax. Number two, we need to read. Growing in godliness is a lifelong process. God's word is the foundation of our security and our strength. Only through prayer, meditation, really can we tap into God's strength and love and really get a handle of what he wants for our life. Ephesians 4.15, God wants us to grow up, to know the whole truth and to tell it in love like Christ in everything. Reading is the key to success. If we read Joshua 1.9, we could save a lot of people a lot of money from watching those infomercials, you know? If you just buy a $3 million property, no money down, and then just sell it immediately and make millions of dollars in three months. Um, if we only could read this, the book of the law shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall med meditate on it day and night, so that you may be careful to do according to all that is written in it, for then you will make your way prosperous, and then you will have success. And this is what God told Joshua after the death of Moses. Here is the key. Here is the secret. Rick Warren has stated in The Purpose Driven Life, he said, spiritual growth is not automatic. It takes intentional commitment. You must want to grow, decide to grow, make an effort to grow, and persist in growing. And then he went on to say something very interesting. Yet many who claim to believe the Bible from cover to cover have never read it from cover to cover. If we read it for 15 minutes every day, we will read it completely once in a year. Second thing we need to do is to read. 
Um, and as I was thinking about this, there's personal Bible reading plans and where you read a couple of verses or chapters every day. And I was looking online that on, there's a lot of resources online that honestly I wasn't even aware of. Um, Rick Warren has one where there's some that you could choose if you want to read it from Genesis to Revelations as the Bible, or you can do it chronologically. They even, you can even choose how you can read the Bible through in a year. And the computer does a lot of the work for you. It kind of tells you what you have to read each day. You kind of check it off. Um, and, and in your notes, I have like two websites that might interest some of you if you want to find out how to read it in a systematic way um, to read the Bible from cover to cover. The daily Bible reading will keep you in the range of God's voice. That's why God told the kings of Israel, keep the word nearby. And in Deuteronomy 17, 19, it is to be with him and he is to read it all the days of his life so that he may learn to revere the Lord his God and follow carefully all the words of this law and these decrees. We have to relax. We have to read. Number three, we have to reflect. And in 2 Timothy 2.7, reflect on what I'm saying, for the Lord will give you insight into all of this. The best way to reinforce your progress of what God wants for your life is to keep a kind of a journal. This is not necessarily a diary of events, but a record of the life lessons that you don't want to forget. We remember what we record. Right? And then in school, I, the students, if you write it down, it will help us remember. Writing help also helps to clarify what God is doing in our life. And later on, it can also be used as a witness to bless others. And I was, as I was studying, I read something that I, was, I said, you know what, I, I need to try this. When you read, a lot of us, you know, those inner noises, we get distracted, and then you read something, and then, okay, you put it down, I did my duty, I did my 15 minutes. But is really that what God wants? And there's ways that we can reflect on what we've read. And I have here, the acronym is PRECEPTS. I don't know if you can see the acronym there, PRECEPTS, um, where after you read, is there a prayer to pray? Or is there a reason to praise? Or an error to avoid? There's a lot of those there. Is there a command to obey? An example to follow? A promise to claim? A truth to believe? Or a sin to confess? So if you read a chapter and then just reflect, did that chapter mention any of these? Just a little jotting down. And that will help us reflect on what God wants for us. Lastly, number four is request. As we spend with time with God, we open ourselves to his work in our hearts and in our lives. Then as we see him working, we want even more. The question is, but what do we pray for? What can we pray for? The Bible has a lot of different models of prayers. And I chose the one in Colossians. Colossians 1, 9 through 12. For this reason, since the day we heard about you, we have not stopped praying for you. We continually, continually ask God to fill you with the knowledge of his will through all the wisdom and understanding that the Spirit gives so that you may live a life worthy of the Lord and please him in every way, bearing fruit in every good work, growing in the knowledge of God, being strengthened with all power according to his glorious might, so that you may have great endurance and patience, and giving joyful thanks to the Father who has qualified you to share in the inheritance of his holy people in the kingdom of light. What do we pray for? There's five great things there if, for spiritual wisdom, to know God's will. What does God want for my life? Two, that we will walk in a manner worthy of the Lord. That we will bear fruit. That we will be strengthened. And that we will always give thanks. This is a, a great model of a prayer that, that they're basically seeking God, God's wisdom, and God's uh, will for our lives. Practical suggestions. What can we do? 
Another thing I read was maybe have a prayer basket or a box or a knapsack, something that you can grab and go. Okay, so if the outside noise is near you, you can move. And then in that prayer basket, box or knapsack, you can have a Bible devotional, a prayer journal, a notebook, pen, postcards. Postcards is a great one. When you're praying and you think of someone, just write them a note. Uh, it is amazing, the encouragement. Um, to send them a little note. You know, most of us don't get real mail anymore, right? It's all emails. So a real, real letter. Um, it, it's a great encouragement. Keep a prayer journal. Maybe separate it into seven sections, one for each day. Maybe you can have different titles such as family, friends, church, Thanksgiving, or, or however you want to do it. Organizing our prayer time keeps us from being overwhelmed while reminding us to be faithful in our prayer life. In Psalm 77, 12, they are constantly in my thoughts. I cannot st stop thinking about your mighty work. And the last R that I didn't include there is replication. Pass on what you learn to others. And that's what we're going to do in a couple of minutes. Pass on. What have you learned? What do you do that works? There's no greater resources than all of us who have gone through daily lives um, to pass it on. And that way, when you pass on more, God will give you more insights to pass on. So there are your four. Relax, read, reflect, and request. Thank you. Thanks, Jeff. That was fantastic. And uh, I also wanted to say I got so distracted before when I mentioned the cannolis that <laughs> forgot to. <laughs> I'm Italian. It happens, you know. Uh, I forgot to forgot to thank Dom and Elizabeth for the fantastic job they did in leading us to the Lord in, in worship too. So, just a great presence of the Lord in our midst. Amen. Well, I think that was just so great what Jeff shared, and I wanted to drill down a little deeper tonight just into one aspect of this because it's something that uh, I think many of us, if you've been a Christian for a while, perhaps it took many years for you to hear a teaching or learn anything really about meditating in the Word. So I want to take just a few minutes uh, to dig down a little deeper into that concept with you. Meditating in the Word is such an important part of our devotional life, and we have to develop a love for the word of God. David said in Psalm 19, more to be desired are they than gold. Yes, than much fine gold, sweeter also than the honey and the honeycomb. You know, the word of God is one of the main sources of strength that God gives to his people. I like to think of it like this, that God gave three great gifts to us from heaven, his word, his son, and his spirit. That's about all that he had to give us, and he gave us everything that he had. And, and my prayer is that, we will, that he will help us to grow in our love for the word. That was his first gift to the world. Um, David expands on this in, uh, in Psalm 19, and listen um, to just how he goes off in just enraptured poetry about how wonderful the Word of God is. The law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. It means it transforms your mind and your soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. The statutes of the Lord are right, making the heart rejoice. The commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. The judgments of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. More to be desired are they than gold, yes, than much fine gold, sweeter also than honey and the honeycomb. Moreover, by them, by the words of the Lord, your servant is warned, and in the keeping of them there is great reward. So question we need to ask ourselves is, do we really desire this book more than gold? Do we consider it sweeter than honey? You know, if we love his word and we learn to keep it, I believe we will, as David said, we will receive a great reward from the Lord. Not only that, we'll be strengthened with supernatural strength. The word of God has power to change your life as we welcome it into our hearts and let him speak to us. It brings us faith, wisdom, healing, and many other benefits. We shared about the Bible a couple weeks ago, but we want to talk about how we interact 
with the word of the Lord. This tonight, in case you hadn't noticed, is a little bit more practical than uh, some of the more theological nights that we had the past couple weeks. You know, some people think that Bible reading is a chore. And I think that's because they just haven't bit into it enough to see how good it is. Maybe their approach to the word is, is the way that kids approach Brussels sprouts, right? But if God is speaking to you, the God who made us and loves us, how could it not be exciting? He says it's like gold and it's like honey. So the better we know it, the better we'll know God. And that, I hope, is a great incentive. So how do we interact with the word of God? Well, as Jeff was sharing, just start reading. And I want to say, don't feel like you have to do this for hours a day. Just start slow. If you've never read the Bible at all, have somebody show you the Gospels and read the story of Jesus. I would say if you are not intensely familiar with the scriptures yet, read it like a story. You know, many times you go to the beach and when you're ready for your annual sunburn, you'll go and you'll sit on the beach and you'll take the latest novel, right? I see you in CVS flipping around, you know, what's, what's going to waste my afternoon? And you buy that novel and you read it for an hour. So now try reading the Gospels as a story for an hour when you go to the beach. It's a much more compelling story than anything out there, I promise you. Start memorizing scripture. Take verses of scripture that are important or that seem to be meaningful to you and commit them to memory. You know, it's going to build your faith when you learn the wonderful promises that God gives us in the Bible. Uh, right away, whenever we advise people or encourage people to memorize the scripture, many people say, well, I'm not a good student. You know, I never was good with those kinds of things. You don't have to be. Uh, just take one verse, one verse. Maybe start off slow and easy. Say, study, you know, John 10, 39, Jesus wept. Maybe you can start there. But take that one verse and just practice it over and over again until you learn it and learn the chapter and verse where it can be found. Start slow. It will change your life. You know, it will help your thinking to become more clear and more orderly. You will no longer be scatterbrained, I believe. If people have ever told you that you're scatterbrained, if you study the word of God, you will no longer be scatterbrained. You should also engage in Bible study at some point. You can do that in a class. You can do it by yourself, learning what the Bible teaches about different topics or maybe studying one particular book of the Bible in depth. If you need help, ask a more experienced Christian. Ask somebody in your group to give you pointers or to help you find a study guide. Lots of great preachers and teachers out there, and many of them have prepared guides that will help you study particular books of the Bible or particular important topics in the Bible. Uh, take the classes that we offer at Harvest Time or get self-study books. It's very easy in our day with all the resources we have to become educated on these things, uh, even if you're doing it by yourself. And I want to show you uh, another source of strength this evening, though, that's less well-known to us, which is meditating in the word. Let's talk just for a minute about how to meditate in God's word before we release you back to your groups. David said in Psalm 119, with your lips I have with my lips I have declared all the judgments of your mouth. What does it mean to meditate in the word or meditate on the word? Jeff shared in Joshua, where God told Joshua, this book of the law shall not depart from out of your mouth, but you shall meditate in it day and night so that you may observe to do according to all that is written in it. For then you shall make your way prosperous and then you shall have good success. Nowadays, meditation means for most people, I think, something that's mental or altering your mental state in some way. Uh, for some people, it, it has the connotation of emptying your mind. But that's not the case in the Bible. In the Bible, meditation is an active word. In fact, in Hebrew, the word that's used there for meditating, it means to murmur something, to mutter it out loud, to ponder it. In the ancient world, the ancient world is, is different today uh, from today. The ancient world, reading and meditation were verbal, not silent. In fact, people read out loud in the ancient world, even in the libraries. Could you imagine that? Nobody would shush you uh, if you went back to an ancient library. And it's the same with biblical meditation. As Jeff mentioned, doing those things, writing it out, 
speaking it to yourself reinforces it much more than just looking at it with your eyes. It's interesting that God told Joshua, he said, the book of the law should not depart from his mouth. He doesn't say from in front of your eyes. It says from your mouth. Isn't that interesting? So that means he should be contemplating it out loud. Let's look at some more of the principles that jo God gave to Joshua there. We should do it out loud would be number one. Number two, he said we should do it day and night. That actually means a couple of different things. Um, it means that we should be doing it every day, certainly. But it also means that we do it in the morning. Your day should begin with God's word. I like to say even five minutes is better than zero minutes. Uh, we should also end the day with the word. And he also said, thirdly, that we should pay attention to all that is written in it. Avoid the trap that some of us have picked up as believers of, of, of just meditating on our favorite parts. You know, we need everything that's in the word of God. Sometimes we have our favorites depending on what mood we're in, you know. I'm sad, so I'm going to read this psalm. You know, uh, that's okay, but God has a lot more good things to say to you, to pick you up. What is meditating on the word then? We meditate on the word when we chew on it, when we mutter, when we speak it to ourselves and ponder a specific portion of it. When we let the Holy Spirit to fully minister the life of God from that passage into our hearts. And that's um, more than just a daily reading plan or memorizing verses. And you should do those things. But this is meeting God in the text at a deeper level and having him feed your soul. Here's how I like to approach it. These are some fast principles for you. Invite the Holy Spirit to illuminate the word of God to you. I think that the Bible is the only book where whenever you read it, you have the opportunity to talk to the author and ask him to help you understand what he wrote. So let's take advantage of that. I don't like to ever assume that I'm smart enough to understand the Bible. Think about it. Think about um, the wisdom of God that he baked into the scripture. We need his help and his wisdom to extract what he put in there for us. Without the Holy Spirit, our meditating in the word will be fruitless. Second, I would say read it aloud. Third, I want to say chew it thoroughly and get the nourishment from every thought or word that's in the passage. It may be profitable for you to break it down word by word uh, in cases where the text will allow you to do that. Um, Psalm 23 was mentioned. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. You know, you can, you can chew on that verse and you can get some important meaning that will strengthen your soul out of every single word in that line. The Lord is my shepherd. The Lord is my shepherd. The Lord is my shepherd, not just the shepherd of all of us, but he's my shepherd. And then the Lord is my shepherd and understanding everything that's contained in that word. I would say also avoid being distracted by curiosity when you're meditating in the word of God. That may sound a little off base to you, but think about it with me. Distraction is a powerful enemy. And the only time that the devil will help you in your Christian walk is when you're praying or reading the word of God because that's when he'll help you remember all those good things you have to do. But the point of meditating in the word is to encounter the Lord there in his word. It's not just for getting head knowledge. There's a time for that in Bible study, but there's also a time and a way to read the word where you're just really meeting the Lord in there. So use a notebook. Don't get hung up on anything like you see a, a strange name or a strange place that's 35 letters long, don't stop there. Use a notebook to jot down things that you don't understand or that you're interested in, and you can research them afterwards. You'll probably find that when you do this, you're going to end up understanding more because you'll know more about the context of the passage that you've been reading once you've been meditating on it. And then later on, you'll find that what you learn about names and what you learn about the details of the text will, will help you. Uh, you will see deeper meanings. You'll see God at work in the story. What I like to um, do is um, give examples of how we do this, how we read and ponder and review the text. Uh, suppose we were reading Psalm 23. Uh, I would say first start by eliminating distractions and ask the Spirit of God to give you illumination. Now what I would do is I would read through Psalm 23 one time at my normal speed. 
If you have good powers of concentration, you can do that in your head, but reading it out loud might be an even better way to start. Then I would get to the chewing part. I would say read the entire psalm slowly to yourself. If you find a significant verse or you find that the Holy Spirit is talking to your heart, uh, read those, spot, uh, those spots repeatedly to yourself. Um, make notes of anything that you wish to learn about until later. Maybe God is telling you there's something important in there that you need to apply to your life. And make sure that you think about those things, that you ponder them, and that you pray about those things afterwards. Then I would say finish up by reading that whole psalm again at your normal speed, the way you did when you first read it. Now, when you do this, this type of exercise, you are no longer feeling the pressure that I need to read huge chunks of the Bible in one sitting. Do you follow me? Uh, I would rather read a small portion of the Bible every day and be fed by it and understand it than read 20 chapters because I have to and not know what was said or not remember it. I think that's important. I don't think that God would want us to read his word and get nothing out of it. But by using an approach like this, in addition to all the things that Jeff mentioned and that I mentioned, if you use this approach, I think that over time, you will really learn and come to really know the word of God. And more importantly, by doing that, you will know better the author of the book. And that's so important. So do all these things. Take to heart everything that Jeff said about all the practical things. And take a leap yourself uh, into that world of, of meditating into the word of God as well. And it will really bless you. So uh, before I throw you back to the groups, just want to remind you what I said about the books of the table. We do have a one-minute devotional guide that's there that's available for you tonight. So please get a copy of that. If you would like to have a daily devotional, that will be a great way to get started working with a text, reading a scripture every day, and then reading something that's going to help you ponder that. And then we also, as I mentioned, got another shipment of Bibles in. So if you don't have a Bible and would like one, or if you have a friend that really needs a Bible, uh, then take one tonight, and uh, both those things will be free for you. Okay, so I'm going to hand you over to your group leaders now, and uh, enjoy the rest of your night. God bless you.